here today. Brenda, so good to see you back here. You know, the masks, it's hard to tell who's behind the eyes. You say somebody's name and they look at you like, I'm not that person. Uh, Well, it says he has four bars. Talk, 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 talk. Okay, sorry. No problem. No problem. Ah. Well, hi, Brenda. <laughs> I think that's where I stopped, wasn't it? Amen. Uh, so good to have you guys with us today, and good to have our, our family from online joining us. Uh, several folks, I met quite a few of them from uh, the funeral this Friday, and uh, it was nice to see their faces instead of just their names pop up on the online stream. Uh, great to have you with us, and uh, good to have our group up at so this Are these your family right here? So good to have you with us this morning. Amen. Amen. I'm trying to look around, make sure I didn't miss anybody. Amen. Well, we welcome you to this morning, this sunny day um, for First Baptist Church in Sydney, Ohio, for those that are joining with us. This past week, a flood of different things that took place. Uh, for those that have been praying for Judy and Andy, there was some great uh, breakthrough on their behalf. Um, and... Um, we continue to pray for them with regard to Judy's health. Uh, there was also uh, a great answer to prayer, uh, though we're at the beginnings of it with Anne, uh, with her eyes, and uh, any progress towards the goal is positive, as they say, and that was a real answer to prayer. And even though we were saddened that Ed's surgery couldn't be completed, it was a wonderful answer to prayer, what they discovered and the reason why they couldn't complete it. And uh, schedule five, six weeks, they're going to try to uh, take care of the major issue that could have been life-threatening. And so we thank the Lord for that. So many different events that have occurred and that we've prayed for, uh, it, it is an absolute blessing. I know many of you have asked me already, and I keep trying to not tell you because I wanted to, didn't want to say it 15 times, but my niece, it looks like she's going to come home from the hospital this next week. And uh, that is just a miracle. I mean, that's just an absolute miracle. Um, she's done real well in um, uh, the recovery. Has a couple little setbacks here and there, but um, to be expected for the type of surgery she had. And uh, we just thank the Lord for that. I'll make mention of that a little bit later on in the service. But uh, so many things. And... Um, I, I don't know if you can identify with this at all, but every once in a while I get a little embarrassed that I pray God answers it and I'm surprised. Do y'all y'all live with that? With you know, pray, ask God to do something, He does it, and I think, wow! Instead of that's what He does, but we thank the Lord for that, Betty. Tomorrow morning, I read that. Yes, thank you for reminding us. So that's uh, Ellen's brother. His first name's Pat, Pete. And so remember Pete, if you would, tomorrow morning. All right. Yes. I talked to Tom George this week. Tom was in this church for a lot of years. His wife was so attached to the church. And when they retired five years ago, they went to Florida. And he said, Tom is had the same surgery that Ellen had some of the same Amen. Amen. Well, they're not going to hold that over on us much longer. I'm just going to shout right back, well, our weather's warm too. So there, yes. Oh, 
Oh, yes. J-G-S, I understand. Jackson Dean Smith. Amen. What a blessing. Uh, and it, it was like 28 pounds. No, no. <laughs> it wasn't 28 pounds. No, okay. Uh, but almost. Nine, uh, eight pounds, five ounces. So big baby. And praise the Lord for that. Uh, we're thankful. Amen. Well, um, in singing and in thinking about what God's done in our life, in focusing on this time of year, this season, this season of being when Jesus paid the ultimate price so long ago for our sin, and approaching the upcoming resurrection service that we will have, our focus is on how amazing our God is. Stand with me and let's sing together Amazing, Amazing Love. <laughs>
church, it is not always our heart's desire when we leave. And we find ourselves living in dishonor to you. Lord, help us to remember that the God of Sunday is the God of Monday through Saturday. And that the ultimate goal and desire you have for our lives is that we might honor you in all that we do all of the time. God, I pray that you would make that uh, uh, our prayer uh, a reality in our lives. As we focus on you today and all that you did for us so many years ago in preparation for the great, great, great victory over death itself, I pray, Father, that our hearts might be filled with joy, that we might sing with all of the emotion of our heart over the great gift and sacrifice that you made for us. And we'll thank you, Lord, today for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Stand, remain standing with me if you would. I think you know this song. It's called, There's Power in the Blood. Now, I don't know if, maybe I'll do this. Do you remember what we did about a year ago with this song? Do you all remember how many times you can get power in that chorus? You know, the chorus goes, there is power, power, wonder-working power. And uh, when I was a little kid, we used to see how many powers we could get in there. There is power, 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 power wonder-working power. I don't know if you're with me. <laughs> all right. So we're going to see how many we can get in there. All right. We get to the chorus. You say, I'm not going to do that. That's all right. Uh, you can be stuck in the mud. I don't care. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, Sing it with one power or 55, whatever you can get in there, amen. Don't try your age, all right? That might get a little tough. But let's sing it, power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Let's sing together. you checked out. I just saw it. Amen. Second stanza. powers than me? And it, you did? Oh my goodness, I'm going to listen to you this time, okay? All right, here we go. <laughs> here we go, number three. feet. She had many more powers than I did. All right, last stanza. Would you do serve us for Jesus?
man, you may be seated. You say, I have never sung it like that before. Well, that's probably not all bad. Amen. Every once in a while it's good just to kind of stretch out and do something a little bit different. Very good, Anna. I was real impressed. All right, we're going to dismiss the kids to junior church. Bye. I know you're missing me already. See how slow they go? They'd love to stay here, but... Amen. What a crew. What a crew. Amen. Great to see the kids going back there. They have such a blast. <clears throat> Titus, you remember those days? Uh, you didn't have to say it like that. You know, like your dad's the preacher. You say, yeah, but it's much better out here. Well, wait a minute now. <laughs> Carter, is he, he hanging me out to dry, isn't he? What do you think about that? I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, what a blessing to be able to have dedicated people that take our kids and teach them and age-based. The same thing that we get out here. We appreciate all those that uh, labor hard. Um, there are several songs in the hymn book that are my favorite. I have like 485 favorites. Two or three of them are not, but the rest of them are all favorites. Amen. And uh, one of them is the next song that we sing, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. I don't know if you ever feel... Like you're too dirty and too bad that God would ever want you. Do you ever look and think, man, did he get taken on that deal? He gave me his righteousness and I gave him my sin. Wow, what a deal. And that when he reached to get you from the muck and the mire, had to bury his arm all the way up to the elbow to get you because you were so far down. Aren't you glad that it doesn't matter how deep in the muck and the mire you are, His grace is greater than all our sin. Now you might have grown up like Brenda in Sunday school her whole life. She's, I don't even think she had a bad thought her whole life till she got saved. Then she married me. And now everything changed. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But she was raised you know, in church and in a good attitude and a good everything. I, I wasn't. I was raised in church, but I didn't do right. And so, you know, the perspective of the depth of the depravity is so, so overwhelming at times. And this song here reminds us that it doesn't matter how deep or how bad, how messed up your life was, God's grace is greater than our sin. Let's stand together. Let's sing it as a testimony to the greatness of our God. You have to lean backward a little bit. Isn't that right, Dave? Lean backward a little bit like that. And then scare the person sitting next to you with how loud you sing. All right, here we go. Marvelous grace.
yes, I sure can. Grace, grace, God. Thank you, Dave. You may be seated. Is there anything like the grace of God? Who else would ever take pity on folks like us? It took great grace to save us. And grace greater than our sins. Amen. Hallelujah for that. What a blessing. And I love to sing those. I like to say I, I've got about 480 some that are my favorite. So some folks grow up in church and they're so bulletin centric that they grew up singing the first and the last of every hymn. They didn't know there were verses in between them. <laughs> and, uh, and they do it because, you know, you have to do two hymns and a special before you preach. And if we're not careful, we get so routine that someone sneezes and they go, hey, that's not in the bulletin. We can't have that. And uh, it's nice to just how the Holy Spirit uh, can take control of a service and can speak to our hearts, not just doing the routine of the singing, but look at the words that are in the text and just become broken because of them. Grace greater than our sin. If you have your Bibles today, and I sure hope you do, I love the sound of pages turning. If you didn't bring your Bible, uh, get two pieces of paper and just rub them like this. So I get excited about that. That makes me preach an hour longer. Uh oh. <laughs> Lord got quiet in here. Did you hear how quiet it got? Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. <laughs> and beginning in verse 14. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. Revelation 3, beginning in verse 14, and we'll read down through verse 20. Here's what God's Word says. Under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. You notice there in the text, Amen is capitalized. Any time in the Bible where you get a word in the middle of a sentence capitalized, that means it's the name of a person. So this just isn't an amen. This is the amen. And in the text, it is about Christ. And so the amen is just another of his names. Amen. You know what amen means? Oh, I wish you could have been with me Friday. You would have heard that so many times. I mean, I couldn't even hear myself talk. They were so excited about the Lord. But amen just means yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. That's the reason down south when you sneeze, they say amen. Like that, I mean, you know, they, they're primed and ready. They want to agree on something. And if you can preach the truth and teach the truth, well, that is even better. Because then they can say amen about something that's really true. And they get to go on. I mean, I've been in churches where they run out one door and come in the other, and then they run all over the place. You say, I would never do that in church. Well, I wouldn't suggest you do. But uh, but to get out of their way, because they'll run right over you. Uh, they, oh, they had a time. And I did too. It was enjoyable. Uh, years and years ago, the first church I ever pastored was down there. It was a total cultural shock for me. I mean, an absolute total cultural shock. Uh, many people have, uh, from those days have said to me, uh, where's your toothpick? And uh, it's because they used a straw and they'd stick it in their mouth and I think they just chewed on it. That was as disgusting as I could ever imagine. 
So I got a toothpick, and it was like halfway. And I'd hold a toothpick on my, oh, he's one of us, okay? It just worked. So to this day, I'm stuck to the toothpick because of those years of ministry down there. I mean, that was a cultural shock to me. But uh, blessed, wonderful people, and great to have them in my memory, and that family especially. Um, the man that passed away, who invited me to come and start a church in his house, I didn't have enough sense to say no. And so I said yes. That's like raising your hand before the questions asked, you know. Um, and when I went to his house, I knew he was a bit eccentric, but when I went to his house, the sidewalk up to his front door had etched in the concrete the Romans Road. I mean, every half a step you'd go, it'd be another Bible verse with a reference of how to lead someone to Jesus Christ. By the time I got to the front porch, I already knew I was dead. I mean, this is just, this is going to be bad. Uh, but it was a blessing and a great time to be with him and to, the, to be with the family. But, it, you know, in, the, in, in those days, people said amen because they agreed with what was being said. Now, there isn't anything biblical that says that you have to say amen. All right? You can agree silently. When I look out and I see someone going like this, you know what I hear? Amen. When I look out and I see someone going like this, I say, I say, amen. Amen. They just got their head twisted the wrong direction. Amen. But it's all amen. Uh, some people do it outwardly. Some don't. Uh, I, I learned to do it outwardly down there or uh, I would have been sunk for sure. But here in the text, it is not just someone saying, I agree. It is the name of a person. And so he says, These things saith the Amen, Jesus, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Now look back up there at the beginning because I rattled on for so long. This is to the church of the Laodiceans. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. May God bless the reading of his word. For the past several weeks, we've been considering the subject, living life on an even kill. This past week, I got a text from someone that I didn't even know who it was. And it said in the text, I don't want to be lukewarm Pray that I'll be hot for God. And I thought, what? I didn't, I didn't even know who it was. I didn't know. Where. And it didn't even occur to me that we mail out the bulletins ahead of time. And he already got Sunday morning sermon Saturday. And he was saying, I don't want to be cold. I want to be hot for God. I thought, boy, the word of God's not bound. Amen. Isn't that exciting? I still don't know who it was. But it was wonderful that he thinks, he don't, or she, that they don't want to be lukewarm. Amen. But here in this passage, we've been looking for weeks now on how to live life on an even keel. Do you ever get tired of that? Up, down, up, down. Oh, I really love God. Now I don't. Now I love God. Now I don't. Now I love God. Now I don't. God's so good. Oh, I can't believe he let me do that. But do you ever get tired of that up and down? So how do we live life on an even kill. Well, we said there's three things that are necessary. One, we must think clearly. We've got to understand that there's a, there's a battle for our mind. The devil wants it. 
And uh, we, we need to realize that we're in a battle. You don't ever go to the battle, all right, unprepared. You go to the battle prepared. That means you're ready. You're anticipating the enemy. And so we must think clearly. Secondly, we must live differently. And we mentioned several things that we should live differently about. And then third, we said that we must fight fiercely. Fight fiercely. We talked about greed. We talked last week about the blahs of life and how easy it is just to get in that uh, kind of area. And this morning, I'd like to suggest that one other thing that we should fight fiercely is our drift into lukewarmness. Our drift into lukewarmness. The reason I say that is because maintaining a wholehearted devotion to God is one of the biggest struggles that the Christian ever faces. It should be our top priority to stay hot for our God. But staying hot for God is a very difficult thing to do for almost every Christian, including myself. And when I'm, say, staying hot for God, I understand that a lot of different thoughts probably come to your mind. But what does that look like? Being hot for God is a very difficult thing to do for most of us because I mean living with the spiritual fervor expressed by the psalmist, which said, and I put it up on the overhead so you can see it, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When I speak about staying hot for God, this is the expression of it. This desire, unquenchable desire, uh, uh, no barricade can hold you back from wanting to get that drink, that thirst for God. And, and so it is so important. Staying hot for God expresses itself in that insatiable passion for truth that motivates us to devour and to discover God's Word. That's uh, uh, Keith was saying to me earlier, you don't mind if I pick on you for a little bit, do you? You're just farther away, I feel like I can run fast enough to get away from you if you do. Um, but he was saying to me earlier in between Sunday school and church, he said, I have so enjoyed this study in Sunday school and it's made me study even more. And he said, it's, it's hard to put it down. And I say, yes. That's what staying hot for God is about, is that, ins that insatiable passion for the truth to get into God's Word. Some of you have not got there yet, amen? It's like, oh no, i got to do this again, okay? But that, that, to have that passion that says, I, I, I want to get there, I, I, I don't want to be detained, I, I don't want to have anything interrupt me, I want to get there so I can devour God's Word. That's what staying hot for God expresses. It is also that relentless compassion for the unsaved that sends us to every corner of the world. The gentleman that uh, uh, I referred to in the funeral, uh, he had the Romans Road on his sidewalk. But that's not the only place. That man had more tracks stuffed in his pocket. He was a truck driver. And he had those western shirts that had the ivory snaps on both pockets. And he'd stick that ivory button down in both pockets, and he had stacks of tracks in both pockets. And it didn't matter if you looked intimidating or not. It didn't matter if you looked like you were interested or not. You were going to get a track. You could tell where Marion had been because there's this line of papers that followed the path that he went from people that got the tracks and went <laughs> like this and threw it down. But not everybody threw them down. He had a love for people. And he had a passion for people. Staying hot for God is about that relentless compassion for the unsaved that makes us do what we normally wouldn't do with our personality. We become aggressive to share the gospel with other people. Uh, being hot for God is that unstoppable joy within our hearts that overflows in prayer and praise. I remember one time walking down a, a pathway and uh, I was just minding my own business, but my mind was somewhere else. Have you ever been like that? And as I was walking down that path, I guess I went into singing. And I didn't even know I was singing. I was in la-la land somewhere. 
But I was singing a great song, and I was going down the path, and unbeknownst to me, here's someone coming up the other side of the path, and all I remember hearing, but it wasn't at the time they spoke it, it was like afterwards, I, I kind of got it afterwards and processed it afterwards, it says, shut that up, <laughs> and that's all I remember, amen, but it, I, I processed it after the fact, and I realized that what I enjoyed was not what they enjoyed. And I was enjoying it because I was living the moment in the words of that song. Staying hot for God is that unstoppable joy within our hearts. I remember one time, Pappy Reveal, I mean, he was over in Evansville, Indiana. He was a happy guy. A happy guy. One day someone walked by his office door and his door was cracked about this much. And they heard mumbling from the inside and they assumed that it must have been that he was praying. And because he was such a great giant for God, they thought they'd peek in to see what a great giant, how they pray, amen. And when they looked in his office, he was sitting at his desk with his hands in the air and had papers in him. And this is what he said, Dottie and I, we pay our bills. These ones are yours, God. And if you don't pay them soon, your name's going to be Mud in Evansville. <laughs> that man was living so much in heaven, in his mind, that he was actually talking to someone he believed existed. That unstoppable joy within our hearts that overflows from praise. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about being hot or staying hot for God. Kindling that spirit, heat within is very difficult. And as a result of that, many Christians have drifted away. I mean, they just turned their back on the Word of God and they've just walked away. They make the same mistake the Laodicean believers made, and that is allowing spiritual lukewarmness to seek and seep into their life. Give me that next one there, Andrew, if you would. Here this girl is walking away from the truth. How do we guard against this problem? We all have it. We've all experienced it. How do we guard against this problem of walking away from the thing that we love? Do you remember the scriptures have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love? How do we walk away from the thing that we love? John's words here in Revelation that we read this morning are like medicine to our spiritual souls. Let me give you some background information in case you didn't know it that will help you to understand what factors may have caused the faith of these folks in Laodicea to have cooled. Beginning in verse 14, the last part of verse 14, notice it says, under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Laodicea was located in the Lycus, uh, Lycus River Valley. I have two maps there. Uh, Laodicea is not too far from Colossae. And I put the first map on the top so you could get a perspective. Everybody knows the boot. See the boot over there on the left? Is it on your left or your right? This is on your left too. Okay. See the boot on the left? That's Italy. Just so you get a perspective of what part of the world we're talking about. And if you follow over to the colored areas over here, you can see Colossae and then the last church above it is Laodicea. Now the bottom map uh, hones you right in there so you can see it in the actual river valley where Laodicea was. See the Lycus River right there? And how could, So they had access to the Mediterranean Sea. That was very important. They were in this valley and had access through this river to get to the Mediterranean Sea. So it was located in that valley, not too far from Colossae. Real close, in fact. As a matter of fact, turn to Colossians chapter 2 with me. You can keep your hand there in Revelation. We're going to come back. But if you look at Colossians chapter 2, uh, it's interesting. These are the things that as you're reading through your Bible, you don't you kind of pass over because you don't know the perspective or you don't make a connection. But in uh, uh, Colossians chapter 2, look at verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timotheus our brother, now watch this, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. Now you know on the map where that, that Colossae is. Okay. Now just to give you some perspective, Turn to chapter 4 of Colossians, chapter 4, and look, if you would, at the, last, or the first part of verse 15, and then verse 17. Verse 15, Colossians chapter 4. Salute the brethren which are at, there it is, Laodicea, 
And then we're going to skip the last part of verse 15 because I can't pronounce that name. And then go to verse 17. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. This is kind of an interesting thing. Apparently, uh, here in the text, Archippus was the pastor of the church in Laodicea. And Paul wrote the letter of the Colossians that we have to the Colossian believers, but in it he mentioned salute or say hello to because of the close proximity to those in Laodicea, especially Archippus, who was the pastor. And notice what he says to him there in verse 17. Take heed to the ministry. Take heed to the ministry. That is, to tend to the spiritual fires and to keep God people burning For God, take heed to the ministry. You know when you tell someone to take heed, you know why you do that? Do you know why when your kids leave in their teenage lives and they leave the house and you say, be home at 11? You know why you say that? You want to help me out? (laughs) Because you don't come home at 11. So you say it ahead of time if you had any ideas. No, okay? Come home at 11. See, that's what he's saying. He says, take heed. Meaning, The tendency is that you're not going to do this. So take heed. That you're not going to take heed to the ministry. You're not going to tend to the spiritual fires. You're not going to keep people burning for God. Take heed. So he says to him. You see, Laodicea, the city, had a lot going for it because it was strategically placed in that valley. And as a result of that, it was strategically placed for the spread of the gospel. Give me the map there, uh, Andrew, if you would. It's right there, close to the Mediterranean Sea. It was strategic for many reasons. One, because of its economic center. Economically, it was one of the richest commercial centers in the ancient world. I mean, you wouldn't think of that just looking at the map, but it was. It was also strategic because of industrially. Industrially, Laodicea was famous for this beautiful raven-colored cloth that was manufactured from the glossy black wool of the local sheep. And it was a lot of sheep in that area that had that black wool, probably where we get our little rhyme from, okay? But from Laodicea, all right? And so it, it had a lot of things going for it. But that's not all. Educationally, it was also strategic for that. Educationally, the city boasted a renowned medical school where an eye salve was made to treat weak vision. It's been around, Ann has it, and uh, uh, Tom has it. <clears throat> it's been around forever, and there's always been this desire to treat it. And so they had a, a, a school, a medical school, that was teaching how to do this. All in all, let me just say this about Laodicea, boundless resources, worldwide influence because it's a strategic map orientation, academic respect, I mean, uh, everyone knew about Laodicea. Laodicea was the perfect place to establish a ministry out of which the gospel flames could ignite the whole world. But I had this conversation with all of my kids, Titus not so much yet, but his turn's coming. And I say to them, as they're getting ready to take that step into adulthood, I say, you have so much, what? Potential. You have so much potential. And then I'll usually go to a sports figure that was physically gifted, that fell because of bad choices. And I say, everyone has potential. You have great potential. Please, don't throw it away for two pieces of candy. Don't throw it away for two pieces of candy. Laodicea was like that. They had so much potential. There was so much they could do Paul saw that. John saw that. Others saw that. Yet tragically, during the 30 or so years between Paul's letter to the Colossians and 
John writing the book of Revelation, the fire of these Laodicean Christians smoldered and then died. As an observer of this coldness, we must ask, well, whatever, would, whatever went wrong? And the answer is in our text. Christ's own words provide us with several important leads into solving the mystery of what went wrong. And we find this assessment being made in the last part of verse 14 of our text and in verses 15 through 17. Regarding the Christian's condition in Laodicea first, we are encouraged to ask Jesus what the assessment is. Do you remember the old nursery? Mirror, mirror, on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? You know, every time that they'd gone there before, the mirror didn't answer, so they just said to themselves, couldn't be anybody but me, right? And then one day, the mirror answered back and shattered their world. That's what happened to Laodicea. The Laodicean was, they were assessing their own self. And here in the text, Jesus said, I, I think I'm qualified. Let me give you my assessment. Let me show you what it looks like from my side. And he, Jesus, reveals that he is the only one qualified to be the investigator. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. He's the Amen. His words are final. He's the ideal witness. His testimony is impeccably true. He's the beginning. He sees like no one else can. The earliest motives and all the drives in us. He knows it all. And what he saw happening at the church of Laodicea was not good. Listen to his indictment, beginning in verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. I think it's interesting looking at that passage to acknowledge something that is eternal. And that is that Christ, with Christ, neutrality is not an option. God does not want us to be neutral about anything. The Christian church has become so neutral, I would say neutered, but it has become so neutral because they don't want to offend anybody. But we didn't learn that from Jesus and we didn't learn that from the Bible. Jesus said, I've come to set one against another. Now, he didn't do that meanly. He did that with truth. Have you ever spoken the truth to someone? Oh, no, I'd never believe that. You speak the truth, someone else says, oh, what a blessing. Amen, that's so true. That's what Jesus did. Jesus spoke the truth, and when he did, it was like a steamship coming down the Ohio River, and the waves were breaking on one side to the other. Truth on one side, rejection on the other. Jesus said, I am the one that should do the assessment, and I want to tell you what I found. I want to tell you that your works... They're neither cold nor hot. No option for neutrality with our God. And if He's the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Sovereign of the universe, and He is, then He deserves our hot, wholehearted best. You've heard me what I try to do in the morning. I'm not raising me as the example. I'm just saying what I try to do. Before my feet get out of the bed, I say, this is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You say, why do you do that? Colossians 3, 1 through 3. If you then be risen with Christ, set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. I want to begin the day with a mental focus of God and of heaven and me to fulfill His will. You know why I do that? Because I know if I don't, it's that heed thing again. <laughs> that I, I, I'll crash and burn quick. If I give heed... I just won't crash and burn as quick. Amen. I want to stay hot for God. And so the first thing I try to do is put my mind on things above. He deserves our hot, wholehearted best. Anything less, honestly, anything less is an insult to Him. 
Look at Him there on the cross right now before your eyes. Look at the prince in His hands. Look at the nail through His feet. Look at the crown upon a, a thorns upon His face. Look at His face marred from beating so much that you can't recognize who it is. Look at the back of His back and the inside of His chest and His thighs and His groin area ripped with a cat of nine tails. Who among us would say, I'm just going to get up and be tippet. I'm just going to be kind of non-committal in this thing. When he gave everything he had. And so he is the only, only worthy investigator. And his indictment is that if you give anything but your wholehearted best, it's an insult. From Jesus' point of view, it is better to be icy toward Him. Think of that. Icy, cold toward Him. And live consistently with our unbelief than to call Him King and live indifferently. Sadly, for after 30 years of ministry, the middle-aged Laodicean believers had settled in their lounge chair religion. And there is a lot of that today. They had become spiritually fat, comfortable, lazy. And worse yet, like the voyagers on the Titanic, they didn't even realize how desperate their situation was. Skipping ahead to verse 17 in our text, look at there for a minute, we discover their ignorance. Jesus, the investigator, he gave an indictment, and now we look at their ignorance. A startling contrast between what believers thought of themselves and their true condition. This is the mirror, mirror on the wall moment. Look at what Jesus said about them in verse 17 of our text. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You see, on the paper, these believers look successful and they look self-sufficient. Spiritually, though, they were on skid row. And they got there by longing for a respectable, non-evasive religion. And how does the Lord feel about this kind of empty relationship with Him? Look at verse 16. Notice Christ's condemnation. So then, because... Thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. I will spew thee out of my mouth. In other words, a lukewarm attitude for a Christian makes God sick. When we talk about the lost more than reaching them, when we go through the motions of worship rather than true personal zeal, when we deck ourselves with impressive religious phrases rather than live what we believe, then we become like standing water in a drainage ditch. Foul, putrid, and nauseating. And we've all been by those places. Jesus would rather our hearts be icy mountain streams or boiling hot springs than tippid pools where algae grows and mosquitoes hover. What a devastating indictment on the later sins. Although the later sins thought they were above need, in God's eyes, they were destitute. Notice the serious admonition given to them in verses 18 and 19 of our text. Christ quickly gives three words of advice designed to rebuild their faith. I love this. First, he tells them to begin living by faith rather than by sight. One of the problems in the Christian life of all of us is that we become so focused on what we see that we get spoiled and quit living by faith. Titus, I need you up here, buddy. Okay, focus up here. Notice what he says. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Why? That thou mayest be rich. I counsel thee to buy, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in a fire. A lot of folks say, well, what is this gold tried in a fire? What does that mean? What is he speaking of? Well, Peter addresses this in his first letter, chapter 1, verse 7. Turn with me there, if you would, real quick. 
Keep your hand there in Revelation 4. We're coming back. 1 Peter <clears throat> chapter 1. And verse number 7. I love when the Bible answers its own question. What is this gold tried in a fire? Notice verse 7 what it says. That the trial of your what? Faith. Being much more precious than of what? Gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with what? Fire. Might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus was telling these Laodicean believers and counseling them to buy of Him uh, specifically gold tried in the fire, He was asking them to step out in faith and believe what God wanted to do in their life. They had evaluated themselves by their great earthly riches. Jesus condemned them for their riches and said, live by faith. Christ says true riches are laid up in heaven as we live by faith down here. Now I'm not saying that you shouldn't provide. The Bible says if any man provide not for his own family is worse than an infidel which is an unbeliever. You ought to do that. I'm not saying don't do that. Throw all caution in the wind. Say I'm living for Jesus. I hope he takes care of me. That's not what I'm saying. Okay. I'm just saying there's a fine line, and we've all faced it, and we will yet face it again, of putting Jesus first in our life or putting something else first in our life. And he's going to say this in just a minute. But they had evaluated themselves by their great riches, and Christ said, I want you to evaluate yourself by living by faith. Let me put some legs on this explanation if I can. Now you may not, this may not be your story. I know it is to some of you. But this may not be your story. When I first introduced my niece needs to you, you were first heard that someone had cancer. There's a lot of people that have cancer. But as I continue to explain her travels and her grief and the problems, some of you, Betty especially and others, grabbed onto them. Betty calls herself Anna's grandma. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's really getting a hold of it. Amen? But we became more and more information about Anna's condition. And the more and more that we gave, the more and more we asked for something in return, which was what? Prayer. And many of you took that for more than just, okay, yeah, and then didn't do it. But you actually prayed. And you gave yourself to praying for her. And that made you farther away from the Lord, right? <laughs> no. So when you start praying, guess what that does? It draws you closer to Him. And then you were waiting on that. I mean, I had a bunch of people on a group text, and I'd text them, this is what's happening now, this is what happened. And everybody would respond back. Everybody was in tune because of this great need. And then we said as she was going to the day before the surgery, this last surgery, the doctor said there is no hope. We do not think that you'll even come out of the operating room. There's no hope. And I text that out to everybody. And everybody started praying. We had special prayer on Wednesday night. The, the uh, surgery was on Thursday morning and throughout the whole day. And many of you are praying through the whole thing. And late in the evening, I text out. The doctors don't know what to do with this. They couldn't find any cancer the problems that they thought and expected they'd find weren't there, and they're in the operating room arguing about who made the wrong decision and thought the diagnosis should be something else. And when I sent that out, my phone exploded with everybody coming back at me and saying, praise the Lord, that's great, isn't that wonderful? You see, stepping out by faith changes us from being cold or indifferent on God and makes us hot. And man, we were going to the throne of God and saying, oh, Lord Jesus, we need help here. And we were, we were there because we were trusting by faith that God would do something that every circumstance around us said, no, it won't happen. Now, Anna is just a microcosm of the great group 
as I look around here and I, I, can, I pan through the audience, that's happened to many of us. That all hope was given up and yet God did something. See, that's what makes us hot. When we exercise our faith, we stay hot for God because we're focused on Him. And that's what this is talking about. So the first thing of three words of advice that God gives, Jesus gives to this church, is to live by faith. Secondly, He tells them to set their priorities right. Look what He says there. I counsel thee to buy of me. And then He goes on, white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. Isn't that interesting? These guys, it was the heart of the industry in their little town to gather wool from these sheep and make garments. It was like, you know, they had stacks and stacks and stacks of wool and stacks and stacks and stacks of bolts of material. They had material everywhere. What an absolute, unbelievable point that Jesus would say, I want you to buy of me clothing. They had it everywhere. But he said, I want you to buy clothing for me, white raiment. In the Bible, white raiment always speaks of the righteousness or righteous living. Making choices. You know, there's something about drifting into the land of lukewarmness that not only do we become cold on God, but we become indifferent to sin. At one time, I'll just use this as an illustration. Some of you here this morning, there was a time in your life you would never, ever allow in your house what is watched regularly on that television. It's so subtle. It just swallows us up. I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. I just want you to be with me in understanding what Jesus is saying. That we so subtly we start giving in and we start listening to people tell dirty jokes and we listen to them cussing our God and swearing our God. We listen and watch the very things that we hate. And that's what he said. I counsel thee to buy of me. It wasn't that they didn't have clothes. They didn't have the right clothes. And this was righteous living. It was so lucrative. The people of Laodicea mistakenly made this black, glossy wool their first goal. And Jesus reminded them in Philippians 1.21, For me to live is Christ first. Get your priorities right, he says. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. So he says, walk by faith. And then secondly, he said, put the right clothes on. Start living right. And then thirdly, Jesus tells them to renew their vision. I counsel thee, anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. They'd become so narrow in their vision, they could not see their own little, anything other than their own little physical world. They were blind concerning the lost. They were blind concerning the work of the devil. They were blind concerning God's will for their lives. And in verse 19, Jesus exhorts them, Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Turn around, he says. That's what repent means, turn around. Turn around. Go the other direction. Rekindle your fire for God. Verse 20 ends this passage of our consideration. And this is what Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Usually we offer this verse to unbelievers with an appeal for salvation. Have you used that before? You know, God's knocking on your heart's door and He wants you to open the door and let Him in. But as we've seen in the context, it's not an unbelieving people that this verse is connected to. It's Christians. The picture that's given to us in verse 20 is that on the outside of the door of the church, on the heart that beats within our chest, the knock is from Christ who's saying, hey, can I come in? 
Who would ever think that we would ever get to the place that Christ would be on the outside of our church and on the outside of our hearts? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Let me ask you this morning, are we like foul-smelling, stagnant ditch water spiritually? It's a wonderful thought, isn't it? In the nostrils of God, are we a sweet-smelling savor? Or do we just make Him sick? And if the answer is the latter, what what do we have to do? We have to open our heart from the inside. See, the indication from Roman, uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 is that the handle to open the door is on the inside. He wouldn't knock. He would just walk in. But He is so gentle. Jesus doesn't enter where He's not invited. And so He bids us to unlock the door, open it, and let Him come in. How about you this morning? Are you running lukewarm? It happens to all of us. It's subtle. And we begin to long for the things, not that are bad, but in the right, the wrong priority. And we lose our sensitivity to sin. And we lose our passion for our God. Well, which are you? While we pray. Father, we end today's sermon just with a heart's appeal to everyone listening to make an assessment of their own. To go to the mirror and say those great famous words, mirror, mirror on the wall. And instead of answering it ourselves, we ask Jesus, how do you see me? Am I hot? Am I cold? Oh Lord, I hope I'm not lukewarm. And if this morning, in the quiet moment that we have, as you test your spiritual temperature, and you make your assessment, perhaps you feel like you're merely going through the religious motions and not experiencing the vitality of God's presence today in your life, Why not open the door to Him right now? Right now where you're sitting, open the door. Make this quiet prayer to Him. Lord, I hear You knocking through the preaching of Your Word and the testimony of Your Scripture. And I want to open the door. I want to be hot for God. Everything else is secondary. Help me be hot for You. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, that same door, God would ask you to open it and let Jesus come in. I never knew love till I met Jesus. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. If you're here today you don't know Him as your Savior, oh, today I, I would pray that you would trust Him that you'd ask Him to forgive you of your sin and come into your heart and save you. May God do that for you to now. If we're going to live life on an even kill, we must fight fiercely the drift into lukewarmness. God bless us and help us to live for you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our last song, stand with me if you would, is there's room at the cross for you. Sing with me today. Maybe God spoke to you in a special way today. Why not right now, where you're sitting, make your appeal to the Lord and say, God, if there's room at the cross for me, I want to stand there now and commit my heart totally to you. Let's sing together. The cross
in the front of my Bible, I have the date when I accepted Christ my Savior. I have the date when I yielded my life totally to Him. And then underneath are a bunch of dates when I realized I was cold and indifferent and rededicated my life to Him. Every once in a while I go back there and I see it took me one time to get saved. It took me one time to dedicate my life to Him. But it's been a struggle all through life of drifting into the valley of lukewarmness. The Bible says this, a just man falls seven times and gets up again. The focus of that verse is not that you fall. The focus of that verse is that you get back up. Now maybe you're running hot for God today. I pray you are. But if you're not, the dangers of running lukewarm for God can affect a lot more than just you. Peter said in John chapter 21, I go fishing. He was upset. He hadn't seen Christ after the resurrection. Didn't know what was going on. He lost his passion for Jesus. You know what the Bible says? Other of the disciples went fishing with him. You never, ever go by yourself. Stay hot for God. Be that example to your family. Be that example to the neighbors. Be that example to your co-workers. Hot for God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Enjoy this day and the warmth of this day. Shake hands with about 150 folks before you leave. God bless. Or knuckle bumps. One of the two. <laughs>